right, you just threw it over to me. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Wisdom of the Elders. This is a concept that I developed about two or three years ago, and I thought we have so many wonderful elders in our community, and they're not going to be with us forever. So <laughs> I knew this was going to be the most interesting one of all. There's no question. You, you've heard of Hatch Match. Well, this could be the dispatch. <laughs> now, look, let me be serious for one minute, and then we can all go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I just want to tell you what this is all about. So we've done three of these at NERFA, Northeast Regional Folk Alliance, and they've all been very interesting and very successful. So when I found out that uh, Folk Alliance was going to be in Toronto this year, I said, ooh, let's make it an international event, and let's start out with a panel of all, except for me, all Canadians. And I think it's a wonderful group of people that I've managed to get together here, and they've all been very gracious about accepting. They were all my first choices. I didn't have to go to any second choices, so here we go. And uh, I happen to be, as you can see, I, I don't keep notes, and I'm very off the wall, so I always need a co-host who is organized and anal and has, you know, <laughs> things written down. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> so I thought, who do I know in Canada? Ah. Tom Coxworth from CKUA. <laughs> so I invited Tom, and he graciously said yes. And then as for the panelists, of course, who else but uh, Mitch Podolik, who has started several festivals as a spare time hobby, I guess. <laughs> and Sylvia Tyson, who has one of the most beautiful voices on the planet and has quite a history, much more than I realized now that I've read the book. <laughs> and uh, Richard Flohill, who lives here in Toronto and just about knows everybody, and everybody knows him. So that is our panel. And we're each going to, we're going to interview each of these people for about 15 minutes, and then we're going to do a more general back and forth, because they all know each other. And then we'll throw it open to questions from you, the audience. There is a mic there to use. So we're going to start with Tom Coxworth doing his thing. My thing is basically to uh, thank Sunny Oaks for inviting me here. This is a real privilege, and uh, uh, organized is, is not quite true with all of these papers here, but uh, Sunny has allowed me to join her here, and she comes from a long history of being in folk music, having a folk family, uh, not only Michael, but of course Phil Oakes himself being her brothers. And uh, she is a producer of many radio programs and quite a knowledgeable person, so I, I am humbled uh, to be brought into this today. I'm looking so forward to this because we have three artists on the stage, the obvious being Sylvia Tyson, who, as you know through the history, especially if, yeah, if you want to applaud at any time for anything <laughs> they do, sit up, get down, whatever. Um, but we also have Mitch and Richard, who are artists in their own right, because we all find ourselves on stages at various points in our life. Much can happen behind the stage, but this is what we're going to focus on, is the wisdom that they have to share for those in the audience, behind the stage, and on the stage. Uh, Sonny, did you want me to start off here? I want you to start with one of your... One of mine? One of mine? Well, because you are within elbow striking distance of Richard, I think you can control that down. We weren't sure if this was going to be a moderating session or a refereeing session. <laughs> and there's actually method to the madness because all of them are kind of connected to Sylvia there, knowing her for many years of her career as well. So we're pretty sure that she's going to be feisty enough to get in there and uh, take over any part of the conversation she feels is not going directly. So I'm going to start with Mitch here. Mitch I have known only for about 25 years. <laughs> Mitch Podolik, of course, as you may well know, certainly here in Canada, was one of the founders of the Winnipeg Folk Festival. Uh, through various, yes, yes indeed, clap when you want. He is still a prized possession of Winnipeg. Nobody else will have him. Um, <laughs> he, he, is gone, he is most noted for recognizing talent as well, more than anything else, not only as a festival uh, director and producer, but he is the man that started his own record label so that he could produce a young upstart who didn't know where he was going. Uh, that man turned out to be Stan Rogers. 
And we will forever be indebted to his ability to see artists and bring artists up uh, through what we call the folk world. Today, he is heading up what's called Home Roots, which has uh, been done since the early part of the 20s and the 30s, but not so formally, with the ability to take artists across Canada, certainly, and Western Canada, and introduce them to an audience, thereby helping them to build themselves. Where I want to start here with Mitch, though, is I feel that to find the essence of a person, you have to start out in the things that you don't know. And in all of the bio information, you never find out where Mitch started and the famous name of Podolik, Mr. Podolik. Tell me about where did you start? Oh, about youth. Yeah, I want youth, your youth. about uh, 15 Oh, by the way, can I mention Mitch? Yeah. Keep it brief. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can give you a one letter, a one word answer. I, I started 15 blocks from here. <laughs> I was born on Yorkville Avenue, which is in the old Mount Sinai Hospital, which is became Yorkville Village. And I grew up on Major Street, which is not too far from here, which was right next to the YMHA almost. And uh, the first time I heard, began to hear folk music was at summer camp that the Y ran. And uh, I remember finding a record cover of a, a Folkways album, Hoot and Annie, but it didn't have the record in it. But I remember being very frustrated at camp. And uh, my sis we, we're, we came from a, a long hair family. We're a classical family. And my father played klezmer music in, in Poland and, uh, and again here. And he used to play that stuff, and I didn't know what it was. It sounded kind of weird to me. But my older sister, Alice, took me to see a fellow named Pete Seeger at Massey Hall when I was 13 years old. And the next morning, I was down at the Richmond Trading Post, uh, which is a, used to exist here. It was a great pawn shop. And I traded a very, 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 very good clarinet for a very, very, very shitty banjo. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it, it, folk music kind of started for me at summer camp and at that concert of Pete's. And uh, I kind of never did anything else after that. When did the uh, world of uh, commerce versus art start for you? When was the first time you put on shows? I was uh, 16. And how much did you lose? And I lost money. <laughs> I, I put, uh, I put uh, on, uh, I did three in a row. And I lost money on, on one of them. I did, just up the block here is Eaton. I lost all money on all three. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not Jewish, you know. <laughs> uh, so... So uh, the, the first one was, was up the street here, right on the corner of, uh, of Young and College is the old Eaton's store, and there was Eaton's Auditorium, and I brought the New Lost City Ramblers there when I was 16, and I lost everything I had and everything I didn't have either. And then I brought Mike Seeger alone to the Bohemian Embassy for a weekend, which we didn't do in those days, but I did, and then I did Reverend Gary Davis, again, when I was <coughs> 16 or 17, and... And uh, I kind of just sort of started there. I just started putting on shows because it was the only way I was going to get to know these people. And that was really kind of half of it. I, only, I wanted to learn how to play more, and I, I wanted to know the people who were making the music. And it, it seemed to be the only easy way to do that. You know? So I became a young promoter. Now, uh, <laughs> at what point? So we've, we've got the early beginnings there. Um, we understand uh, that uh, you came from a European family out of Poland to Canada, uh, starting in the folk movement in the early part of the 60s. What part did you decide to pursue and end up in Winnipeg? Okay, I have a... a <clears throat> well... And please be kind, when did you buy long underwear? <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> I don't find Winnipeg cold, it's fine. Um, I, uh, at the same time as I got interested in PC, you know, you know, in those days, politics, revolutionary politics, socialist politics, the civil rights movement particularly, were, were very much part of the folk world. And so the other person I hooked into in my life besides Pete Seeger was a fellow named Leon Trotsky. I don't know if you ever heard of him. <laughs> He's kind of a nice fellow with a goatee. I knew team. you'd get there. <laughs> yeah. And kind of and the two of them together kind of became the two major influences in my life. And I joined the, the Trotskyist youth movement and then very quickly thereafter became an organizer. And very quickly thereafter found myself first in Edmonton and then in Winnipeg and then in Halifax and 
then in Winnipeg again, and, and then in Vancouver. You know, just, it ended up being I went where I was needed, and but Winnipeg kind of kind of struck some kind of real thing with me. I don't know, the first time I saw the prairies, I couldn't quite believe what I was looking at, and I kind of fell in love with the place, and uh, I still am in love with the prairies. I still like going out. I, one of my favorite moments was uh, there was this wonderful story with the Washington Squares. Do you remember them? People yes, remember them? Yes. Being driven in by a site by a travel crew from the Winnipeg Folk Festival into town, and and what's his name? Who was the leader of that band? Tom, not Tom Goodkind, right? S saying out loud to everybody, "Look, there's nothing out here. There's nothing out here. This is flat. This is empty." And the volunteer shuttle driver stopping and pulling over at the side, turning around and giving him a five-minute lecture about what was out here, you know? <laughs> and everybody, when he finished, everybody else in the van cheering, you know, kind of. But uh, the prairies have a certain charm that nowhere else does, and I'm never going to live anywhere else. Is it true that uh, the reason you, you became one of the co-founders of the Winnipeg Folk Festival is so, so you could actually book yourself to go on stage and play no. banjo? <laughs> No, I have. So that's a fallacy. There's no. No, I, I only ever played uh, once on the stage of the Winnipeg Folk Festival, and that was the last night of the last year I produced it. Right? And I thought I should just do that, but it was also raining. It shows and remarkable it, restraint, I think. <laughs> <laughs> or kindness to the audience. Well, I'm a banjo player, you know. <laughs> you know there's a certain preordained thing that you're supposed to do if you're a banjo player. Anyway, yeah. Um, when we look at uh, your career. One of it has been supporting many, many artists, and certainly I've mentioned the Stan Rogers support. What is it you feel uh, about the essence of the man Stan Rogers from when you met to what he still has created to this day? Well, he's left us the best legacy almost anybody has. You know, it's a... Uh it's a pile of songs, and you hear people sing them, and sometimes you hear them sung so terribly that you cringe, and sometimes you hear them sung so beautifully that you cry. And what oh. story from Stan oh, can you tell us? A funny story. Well, I got, oh boy. And don't name the names of the people around them, please. That's the problem. <laughs> okay, the, the best story of Stan is my son Leonard. Some of you know my son, Leonard? So, okay, so when Leonard was about three years old, we were at the Owen Sound Folk Festival, and along came Stan, right? And he saw Leonard, and Stan, in his big way, you know, hiya, Leonard, and he picked him up, and Leonard said, sing a song for me. So, holding Leonard, Stan sang Barrett's Privateers, and a whole, and a whole crowd of people gathered around, right? And then when the, when the, when he finished, there was applause, and Leonard looked at him and said, can you sing Heart Like a Wheel? <laughs> <laughs> uh, which, to me, is still the, the, almost the best moment. When you, we, you know, when, by the way, so I mentioned Stan Rogers, I mentioned certain aspects. There is no way what's happening here, we're going to cover in this two hours what these people represent. So if I touch down on certain places, it's only to encourage you to go in that direction, to follow up on, on the things that's available for you to look up online. When you discover artists, generally, what is it you first feel to them, whether you're booking them, promoting them, or telling them how to manage their career? Well, you know... What does discovering artists mean? It, what it really means is running into somebody's music. And like, I'm just like everybody else. And I'm not like any, di I'm not different from anybody because music is so subjective. You know, either it speaks to you or it doesn't speak to you. And so I, I discover the only those artists who speak to me, you know? And I think that's true of, of everybody. I think that's true of everybody here, you know? and, and I think it's true of everybody here. <clears throat> the human thing is that you that you discover, either as an audience member or as a producer or whatever, what speaks to you as a human being. And and and, boy, I in Home Roots we're getting 200 submissions every eight weeks, and we're sitting down and we are listening to every single one of them, because that's the only principal thing to do with that stuff. And 
And every once in a while, you got everybody in the room sitting there going, wow, listen to this young guy, or listen to this young girl. What a, what a great thing. And it's only that. It's only that subjective, undefinable thing, you know? You know, he, he, there, there's writers who are great, precise writers, and, and there are guitar players who are great, precise guitar players, and sometimes they can't speak to anybody, you know? So what is the truth? The truth is what, what is there is what is there. Every morning when you get up, you address the day, you have your pee. <laughs> <laughs> you walk out into the room, and you have to get through the rest of the day. What is it you tell yourself every day about what you do and who you are? Oh boy, I haven't done that for a while. Why? Because uh, I'm older and I don't need to, and I know who the hell I and I, and I don't I don't I know who the hell I am now, you know, and uh, and I'm pretty satisfied with what I've done uh, in my life. I don't think anything, you know. I've created a couple festivals and and a record company that that exists still, and uh, um, I've my work my work accidentally has touched a lot of people. Which I'm proud of, you know. I, I think that it, I think the most important thing that that what I've done has done is encouraged other people to pick up instruments and play music, and I think that's the most important thing. The whole concept of self empowerment is is important, but it's not what I think about in the morning. Mostly, I like to get up and have a dump, you know, make breakfast, you know, because that's kinda, As you, would. you know, because that's what you got to do in the morning. I don't usually think to be great philosophical thoughts in the morning, you know. Bacon and eggs becomes, you know, fairly philosophical, you know, and, uh, and getting the ache out of my shoulder and uh, and going to work and uh, and working with a bunch of young people, which I do, which I really like, you know. I I I managed there's a young man named Tim Osmond who I work with who. Uh, who is now the artistic director of, of Home Roots, and the best thing, it was the best transition I was ever in in an organization because I said, Tim, uh, do you think you're ready to be artistic director? And he said, oh yeah, I can probably do it. When do you want to do that change, Mitch? And I said, how about five minutes from now? <laughs> and, and that was the change, and that was the transition, and that was because because you take the, if you're smart, you take the skills that you have and you try to pass them on to whatever degree you possibly can, knowing that it ain't going to be perfect. You know, I uh, I um, I'm I'm uh, the founder of the Winnipeg Folk Festival, and the Winnipeg Folk Festival is, in my view, organizationally one of the most sweet, beautiful organizations that you ever see. But I don't like the show the last three or four years, right? So that that's a subjective call. Right? And, and making that kind of subjective call is really, is A, is hard on me to do that because I feel loyalty to the place. But on the other hand, you know, I really like going to the Stan Rogers Folk Festival, you know, because you go to the Stan Rogers Folk Festival, you hear folk music. Um, and, and I like to hear folk music. You know, I, won't, I don't want to hear shit pop, you know, <laughs> and I'm just not there. And so... Uh, <clears throat> Does that I, make me? Does that make me feel disappointed about the Winnipeg Folk Festival? Not in your life, because it's a great organization. You know, one so. of the things about the people on this stage is uh, they have, in their time, uh, placed their opinion forward, <coughs> <laughs> uh, and have been, uh, in some cases, not in all cases. There's people that do it very eloquently. Uh, Mitch, mm. when was the last time you put your foot in your mouth? And oh, I how, do all the how, time. How, how did you extract it? Should you, and I know it's a rare case, have been wrong? I put my foot in my mouth yesterday morning, <laughs> and I didn't extract it because I like it right where it is. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, said, uh, I said some of the same things about the Winnipeg Folk Festival, and the new executive director and president were sitting there, and I didn't know them. <laughs> and they came up afterwards, and we had a very nice important couple hour conversation you know about the future of the Winnipeg Folk Festival I have decided pretty much that I'm I hit 65 and I decided that's the line beyond which uh, the politics of what you think disappear right I'm too old to be polite about shit and I think and I think it's just uh, no point in that you know I think fuck diplomacy you know there's nothing as good as the truth, you know? There's nothing as good as that. So. And let me just point out to you, this is the end of our 15 minutes with Mitch. <laughs> um, 
We will hand this over to Sonny. Um, Mitch will probably elaborate <laughs> at your convenience when you get to ask him questions. Do not hold back, Sonny. And now for something completely different. <laughs> And never once did Sylvia's elbows ever get to Mitch. I'm, I, I was watching. Well, when I knew I was going to do this, I went to my LP collection, and I discovered, much to my amazement, that I had seven Ian and Sylvia albums. And I do a radio show, and I took the first album to the radio show, and I played the first song from that first album on my show, and that song was Rocks and Gravel. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I've been a fan of Ian and Sylvia since I can remember, and that's all I ever thought of was Ian and Sylvia. But having done research, I am just absolutely amazed. I'm going to touch on a few things here, Sylvia, and then come back and try to get more specific. Their first gigs were at the v Village Corner Club, which is here in Toronto. W was, thank you, Richard. Okay, uh, they started out as Ian and Sylvia. They became great speckled Bird, and that was the beginning of country rock. They were actually kind of the founders or helping to found the, the concept of country rock. And then Sylvia actually hosted a radio show that was produced by Paul Mills and Bill Garrett. And that ran for five years, and it was called Touch the Earth. She did interviews, right? And then for the last 20 years, she's been in a group of women's quartet called, called Quartet, so she's still doing the music. And la uh, she's won the, she has been awarded the Order of Canada, which is not too shabby. You can applaud for that one. <laughs> she's one of the founders and past president of the Juno Awards Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. And in her spare time recently, since she had <laughs> nothing much to do, she wrote a novel, which is called Joiner's Dream. And we'll ask her a little bit about that as well. So let's kind of work chronologically. Does that work sure, best for go you, ahead Sylvia? On. Okay. Well, I'd like to hear about the early days, the Village Corner Club, and what it was like when things were starting around here. I uh, moved to Toronto from Chatham, Ontario in 1959. And uh, the reason I ha had moved here is because I had already met Ian. I'd made a couple of trips. I was always pretty calculating in what I did. And uh, <laughs> I had met Ian on a trip to Toronto just to see what was happening in the folk scene. I was already interested in folk music at that point, mainly from books because I didn't have access to, to records or live performances. Could you uh, talk about your parents and how that leads into what you're saying now? Well, uh, both my parents were musical. Uh, my mother was trained as a classical pianist. Her specialty was Chopin, and she was an organist and choir leader, so you can imagine where I spent a large part of my young life in the choir stalls, singing alto. We always had more sopranos than we knew what to do with. <laughs> and if the tenor didn't show up, I'd sing tenor. <laughs> Uh, but it was great early training. My dad uh, played by ear. Uh, he uh, sold musical instruments uh, for the T. Eaton Company. And the two of them met in a very romantic way. They met when they were piano and sheet music demonstrators for the T. Eaton Company in London, Ontario. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I, I moved to Toronto got myself a job in a place called the Starlight Stores, which sold questionable clothes to questionable ladies. <laughs> but got fired because I couldn't figure out how to run the cash register. <laughs> and uh, at that time in Toronto, early, early 60s, there were actually more places to play than there were people to play in them. So finding work wasn't hard. It wasn't that it paid you much, but it paid you a little bit and there was you could work every night of the week if you wanted to. And, uh, and I did, and we did. Ian and I did form a duo. We, uh, we introduced a, a new concept to the folk scene in those early, early days. We rehearsed a lot. <laughs> 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 um, 
And uh, Village Corner Club was uh, one of the first places we played. I had a standing um, uh, gig that was uh, a poetry night at the Bohemian Embassy. I was the only musical performer on that night, uh, along with such luminaries as uh, Margaret Atwood and Milton Acorn and, and Raymond Souster. And, you know, it was quite a, quite a heady experience. As a matter of fact, my first night performing Poetry Night Bohemian Embassy, I felt so outclassed that I decided to do all 16 verses of Woody Guthrie's Ballad of Tom Joad, <laughs> which I've never done since, and I don't remember a word of it. <laughs> um, and uh, so at a certain point, I, I guess Ian and I became the Kansas City stars in, in Toronto and decided it was time to hit the big time. Okay, and then you went to the other village, the one in New York, Greenwich Village. Yes. And what was that like? I, I also want to put in context the time that you were out there, you were one of the few women. It was such a male-dominated uh, scene. It was, it was very male-dominated. Male Certainly when I got to New York, there were others. There was Carolyn Hester and, and uh, Judy Collins, um, to, to name a couple. And of course, Maria Muldar. Uh, but there weren't a lot of women, and and so uh, it was a, kind of a, a tight world for me. One of my dearest friends uh, in in New York was uh, Susie Rodolo, who was uh, going out with Bob Dylan at that point, and we reconnected at a later date. But unfortunately, we lost her a couple of years back, which was very sad for me. But there weren't a lot of women to, to relate to in, in the folk scene, partly because there weren't very many of us, and partly because we were like ships in the night. We were on the road all the time. And if we saw each other, it was probably in an airport somewhere. You know, uh, if uh, um, the, there was a standard thing about, about no, playing clubs in New York, they always figured if you were in New York, it was because you weren't working. <laughs> and they didn't want to pay you very much. So <laughs> we didn't actually play that much in New York. Oh, really? Well, but you did travel around the States a lot. Uh, we, um, when we went to Toronto again, it was, was planned ahead of time. I'm a Virgo, what can I say? Um, a, a friend of ours, uh, Ed Cowan, went down to New York with us. He'd done a kind of some research on who was in the management business in New York at that time, and the first name he had in his list was Albert Grossman. And so we went without uh, any... Uh, preambled into Albert Grossman's office that he shared with George Ween, uh, who and and they were uh, involved in in the Newport Jazz Festival at that point. The Newport Folk Festival was a, just a gleam in somebody's eye at that point, and uh, um, so we auditioned for Albert right in the middle of the floor of this enormous office he had on Central Park West. It was a former mansion of some kind, and. Uh, he listened to us and said that he really liked us, but he just signed this trio and he didn't know how much time he was going to have for us. That was Peter, Paul, and Mary, of course. Uh, but we assured him that we were Canadians and pretty low maintenance, so he, <laughs> he took us on. <laughs> All right. I just didn't realize you were going to stop right there. <laughs> I want to know about the uh, great speckled uh, bird. How did that come about? Why did it come about? Uh, the great speckled bird came about because Ian and I had, had done a number of records, and we'd sort of dabbled with the, a pop sound, which we, which wasn't very successful, and we didn't enjoy it very much either. And uh, all, both of us had been drawn to... Um, country music as well as folk music. But main, me mainly because I had always been um, so in love with Appalachian music. Um, and we had a, a contractual conflict with Vanguard Records. We wanted to go with, with another label. Uh, the Vanguard contract at that time was quite ambiguous and when you read through it, it, it meant either that we'd given them one album too many or that we owed them another one. And uh, 
So they decided it meant we owed them another one, but they decided, too, that, that they would release us to do an album for this other label, thinking, I suppose, that if that was successful, they'd still get another album out of us. Um, and what we decided to do was to go to Nashville, not to do a straight country album, but because there were so many great players there and so many people whose music we respected and we certainly got to play with a lot of them. We got to try out a lot of the studios. We got to go into the old RCA studio that Elvis was in. You know, it's just, just basically uh, a shopping trip for us, which was, was quite, uh, quite successful. And um, uh, that was the beginning, really, of the, of the country rock thing. And we decided, having done that album, we kind of took a year off after we did that album because we were not quite sure what we wanted to do. And we did, what we basically decided was that we didn't want to go on the road if we could not make the same kind of music from the stage that we had done on that album. And that was when we formed The Great Speckled Bird. Okay. And I also noticed on your early albums, I was really surprised to see one of your backup uh, guitarists was uh, John Harold from the Greenbrier Boys. Yes, John played on, on uh, two or three of our early albums. Um, there was a, a... How did you meet him? Well, we were in the village, hanging out in the village, and, and, and uh, the Greenbrier Boys, we, we were good friends with all of those guys, as we were with most of the players, bluegrass and and uh, traditional players. And uh, we just loved the way he played, that, that kind of very driving, percussive, flat top playing. And, and uh, um, it caused some problems for John, actually, because John uh, was a very meticulous player who, who very carefully worked out everything that he played. And we used to send him a tape six months ahead of doing an album, and he would very carefully work out what he was going to play on it. And, and uh, so when the albums came out, everybody heard this marvelous picking and wanted to hire John Harold to do their recording sessions. <laughs> and uh, he, he kept saying, I can't do it unless you give me time to do it. I think they just expected him to rip off those licks, you know, easily. And, and it never was easy for John. Great player, but a hard, hard worker. Okay, and now let's go to the radio show, Touch the Earth. Yes. How did, did you enjoy that? You did it for five years, I believe. Yes, I think I might still be doing it, actually, if uh, CBC hadn't decided to, to get a new broom. Oh, really? Um, but certainly people still talk to me as if that show were on yesterday. It, it, it really seemed to touch a chord with people. One of the things I was very pleased about was that we were in right at the beginning of the home, so-called homemade albums. And uh, uh, one thing the show gave us leeway to do was to, in effect, advertise those albums. So when Stan Rogers came out with an album, we were able to give him, give, give people his mom's address. <laughs> and they could order his albums. And it also meant that, uh, uh, I see Paul, uh, in the audience uh, probably uh, can back me up on this, but I think that we almost single-handedly created the uh, the uh, homemade record or or independent record part of uh, the business at that stage in Canada, and I'm very very proud that we did that. Also, it it enabled people all over the country to hear artists from parts of the country they would never have heard from otherwise and, and created careers, I think, for quite a lot of people. I don't know if you would agree with that or not. But. I would, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, this is your chance to have a brief plug for your new book, mm -hmm. Joiner's Dream. I want to know a little bit about the book. Uh, well, Joiner's Dream is in the form of a, a journal that's kept by one member of a family from, of each generation from 1790 to the present day. Starts in England in 1790, moves to Canada about the time of the First World War. And uh, it's a kind of a secret journal even within the family because it's, it's kept by the member of the family that is most like the previous one and not all of their activities are uh, credible or even honest. Uh, 
They are also uh, musicians, traditional musicians. There's a fiddle that's handed down in the family called Old Nick. And uh, so it's, um, it's a saga, is what it is. <laughs> And finally, I'm going to ask you to please give us a sample of your beautiful singing ability. Oh, my. <laughs> well, I, I didn't feel up to, to singing and playing, but I, I can do a bit of a song. I have to, I have to, <laughs> it's part of being an elder. Is to <laughs> uh, this is a song that I, I wrote for the most recent quartet album. And I think it kind of leans on some of the traditional stuff that uh, that I developed with. It, and now it's called Twenty Shades of Blue. I want you to know this much preceded <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> Babe, I swear there's an artist in you. You painted my love. Twenty shades of blue and I don't want to be your canvas no more. I ain't going to be your canvas no more. No, never no more. My life used to be like a bright sunny day. You painted it over in shades of gray And I don't want to be your canvas no more I ain't going to be your canvas no more No, never no more Let me spell it out for you in black and white The way that you treat me just ain't right and I don't want to be your canvas no more I ain't gonna be your canvas no more no never no more you want to change my religion change my name Fit me into your picture frame, but I don't want to be your canvas no more. I ain't going to be your canvas no more, no, never no more. I'll tell you something straight from my heart. I never will be your work of art Cause I don't want to be your canvas no more I ain't going to be your canvas no more No, never no more Cause babe, I swear There's an artist in you You painted my love Twenty shades of blue and I don't want to be your canvas no more. I ain't going to be your canvas no more. No, never no more. No, never no more. No, never no more. Thank you, Sylvia. It's beautiful. You'll get a chance to say more later. Now we're going to go back to Tom and Richard. I need a few moments from that, don't you? <laughs> uh, pretty amazing. Richard, Richard Flohill. <coughs> Richard, like Mitch and I, have sat backstage on a number of occasions. Never, never have we asked personal questions. I've had the fortune or misfortune to have Richard Stay with me uh, this past summer. And I'm, I'm going to come back, too, <laughs> if you'll have me. It took me three days to get over the sight of him in his bathrobe. <laughs> Having peanut butter in my house and being very concise and specific of the type of scotch whiskey I was to serve him every day at noon. He rifled through my entire record collection and by the way, he was wearing a house coat. Did, did I mention that? Because there's no bloody way I was going to frisk him to see if he was taking anything out. 
That's too much information. I know. I'm already <laughs> heading in the wrong direction there. I did feel some guilt and made sure that his week, which was filled with listening to Duke Ellington, was fully fulfilled by he hinted how much he loved the collection I had. So it rests at his home now so that he can listen to the Duke Ellington. A man that started off in England coming to Canada in 1957. Uh, a junior reporter. He could have been a sports reporter, you know. He could have been a political commentator. So many things that he could have been, but he ended up in the world as a publicist, artist manager, uh, a festival director, um, putting together, working with a number of festival organizations throughout the world, writer, certainly accommodator, as everybody will know, uh, and some would say a musical visionary. He, like the people on this stage, treats his art of being a publicist and a supporter of youth and people who are in all music genres as being the art of making sure that music gets out there into so the I'm public. So I'm blushing. No. <laughs> yeah, I've seen you blush. Uh, pull up your host coat tight <laughs> as to not to frighten the little children in the audience. <laughs> Richard, you come to Canada in 1957 and here you land uh, did you not think at that time for a moment that there was a bit of a wasteland here in Toronto from your cultural iconistic view of listening to all the jazz greats you, you in have England? No idea how incredibly dull Toronto was. The second tallest building was the Royal York Hotel. Uh, I stayed, uh, well, I came in via New York and I was dog tired and I, the Canadian immigration guy said, oh, how's the Lonsborough Hotel? And he mentioned the pub that I used to drink in in my home, small hometown in England. Turned out he'd, he'd um, been stationed there in, in the war. So I said, where should I stay? And he said, the Ford Hotel. The Ford Hotel doesn't exist anymore, but it's where that black glass building called the Atrium was. There were three towers, and it was full of questionable ladies and grumbling Englishmen. I'm a pipe fitter, and the best thing they've offered me is pipe welding. Well, bugger that for a game of soldiers. You know, that, and the entertainment was, I swear, Lloyd Burry and his fabulous organ. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> he played in the grotto. So I came here because um, they wouldn't let me in the States because I didn't know whether my grandmother had been a communist. Oh, that was a big deal for them in, in the 50s. And um, the first night in Canada, I wandered down Young Street and I saw this sign. It said, Earl Hines and his all-stars. I went, my God. So I went in the, in the bar. It was in the afternoon. I said, Earl Hines? And he, yeah the guy that played with Louis Armstrong in the 20s and had a big band in the 40s, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, how much is it to get in? They said, it's free, but you have to drink two beers. <laughs> I thought, this might be the promised land. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, and still today, you can tempt him with two beers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, uh, when did the left turn, right turn of a career happen where you went from getting a job as a regular wage and then deciding that, you know, maybe I can do a lot of this on my own? Well, it took some time. I, I couldn't get a job as a newspaper reporter, which is what I'd been doing in England uh, from the age of 16 on. Um, and I wound up editing trade magazines, you know, like the first magazine I worked on was called Electrical Contracting and Maintenance in Canada. <laughs> and all I know about electricity is you don't put two fingers in the socket at the same time. <laughs> so you, you just learn the language of the trade and then you carry on. Um, I was really a blues fan and I, I, I used to go down to Chicago and I wanted to meet Muddy Waters and I did. And I heard Howling Wolf in the worst club in the world. Oh, what a toilet that place was. I heard, and you can be killed if you're the wrong shade of pink at the wrong time of night in the wrong part of town in Chicago. So I thought after a while, I'd bring these people to Canada and they would be safe. And so I brought, I've, I'm proud to say that I'm responsible for bringing 
for the first time they'd ever played in Canada. Muddy Waters, Buddy Guy, B.B. King, Bobby Bland, Robert Nighthawk, Sleepy John Estes, all this. So I get this rap as a blues maven, and then I get invited to a folk festival. What the hell is that? <laughs> so I went to host a blues workshop. And that weekend, I heard your brother, uh, Gordon Lightfoot, who I did know before, Ian and Sylvia. Uh, I still wear cowboy boots all the time because Ian did, and I thought they were really cool. Um, and I don't have anything else. Um, who else was on that show? Leonard Cohen, uh, 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 Buffy, and it was like being hit on the head with an apple. There was all this music I had no familiarity really with at all, and um, I guess I've been a born folky stuff. I still like blues, big time. Richard is also in the process of putting a book out. He is asking for donations. No, I've got the donations. <laughs> okay. Uh, anybody that doesn't want to be mentioned in the book, you can double your donation. <laughs> okay? And we, we know that that's... A, we have uh, such wealth of information here. I'm going to ask Richard now to touch down on three, quickly, events that you think were turning points either with artists or in your career, and let's just take it up to the 80s. So we're looking at the 60s, 70s. Tell well, me about the things that you think made you as the person you are today, starting at that point. I don't know why yeah, I, I realize am. Where I'm, I realize where I'm going here. Well, uh, one event was my, my, that I just mentioned was going to Mariposa in 1965 and just having my mind altered. Um, I did a great show at Massey Hall in 1970, I think. One of the things about growing old is I, I, I remember stuff okay, but I don't remember when it was. Um, and I did the show at Massey Hall with Bobby Blue Bland, Buddy Guy, and what turned out to be the last performance, or almost the last performance, of a wonderful guitar player called Lonnie Johnson, who lived in Toronto at that time. And I lost $1,200 that I didn't have, and I quit smoking the next morning. And I was doing two and a half packs a day since I was 16. So the fact that I am alive today, I owe to that one. And every time I see Bobby Bland, I thank him. Because <laughs> if I'd have made money, I'd be dead now. I can't think of anything. Yes, I can. Um, the one thing I am sort of proud of is um, helping young artists get started. And I was very fortunate enough to work with people like Katie Lang, Serena Ryder, Arnie DeFranco, uh, Lorena McKennett, who I still work with 26 years later. There's loyalty. Um, and a whole bunch of others that I work with now, who you may not have heard of, but you should. And you will. And you will, yeah. Um, a woman in Montreal called Alejandra Rivera. I, I think this woman is just amazing. You've got to hear a young girl, she's 22 now, but when I first heard her, she was 17, and she bearded me in, in a corridor and said, I know who you are, I want to play this song. And she pinned me against the wall and played a song about how to be a model. You've got to be very tall. You've got to be very thin. You've got to be blonde. You've got to eat really fast, and then you've got to throw up. Oh. <laughs> and I thought, the kid's 17, and she's writing songs about this? Her name, her name is Ariana Gillis, and you've got to check her out. She she's is, here. She is here, and she is... Uh, when I started working with Katie Lang, I knew, I knew this was going to happen. And I am equally certain um, about Ariana. Sorry, I, I rambled. That's all right. I expected that. <laughs> yeah, right. You're Richard Flohill. That's what you Here's do. Here's the thing, and we won't allow him to go to three because that'll put us to <laughs> I four can't this think. afternoon. <laughs> Richard, what is it that you feel when you see one of these artists? You know there's something there. You know that they have it, and you know that you have to forsake commerce for art. Uh, well, what, what, what is it that makes the I the don't know what it is. When I, when I 
uh, work with somebody as a publicist, as a whatever. First of all, I won't work with anybody whose music I don't like or who I don't like personally. I worked with Nana Muscuri. I wouldn't cross the road to hear her sing with <laughs> all God blessings. And she covered a couple of Sylvia songs, I think. But of all the wonderful, feisty, on the money broads I've ever met, Nana Muscuri is it. Um, what I look for is, yes, you spot the it, whatever it is. I heard it with, with Lorena, I heard it with Ariana, I heard it with all sorts of people. But then what you have to find is other stuff which is as important as the talent. And I think Mitch began to touch on this a bit. Uh, very un-Canadian quality. Are they ambitious? Are they focused? Are they going for it? Are they working hard? Are they prepared to give up some of the things that we sort of think are important? Relationships and <laughs> friendships with your folks and all that shit. Because if that is in place and the talent is there, it, it will happen. And there's so many variants. Um, I look for a distinctive voice. I work with a young woman, who actually she was my assistant for two years, called Jada Kelly. Jada has a voice that will break your bloody heart. It's, it's, it's a special voice. I work with um, two girls who call themselves Scarlett Jane, Andrea Ramelow and Cindy Dwar. And, and I called them the Everly Sisters when I first heard them. Um, but they're going for it. And they will succeed. Yes, there's luck, that's, and good people working with you and all that stuff. But the ambition and the focus and the energy are, are equal, have to be equal to the talent. You're in a business where um, as the world changes, people move on, people come back. You've seen so many changes in the publicity world and, and putting artists on stage. In those changes can happen disappointment. And with that disappointment, you have to deal with it. And many of us in the room have had to deal with a lot of disappointment in our lives, but your business is supporting an artist. How do you deal with that? And can you give us an example when of... When you get fired, you mean? You get your ass fired. <laughs> you get your ass fired. Yeah, that's, that's basically what it comes down to. Um, I mean, you know, do you go, ho, ho, ha, ha, I'm moving on? No. Or yes. How, 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 do you, how do you deal with that? Because we all are looking for the secret way of understanding that. Well, I just got fired a couple of weeks ago by Matt Anderson, who is a brilliant guitarist, um, amazing talent, and somebody who I really like as a person, although he's not a good communicator. And he fired his manager after eight years, and me as his publicist after two. Shit happens, you move forward, you go on. Um, and I think the one thing I've learned, if this, well, the main thing I've learned is that I have less and less time to do all the stuff that I had in mind to do, and bit by bit. Although I'm, I'm very fond of a quote of an English guy called Les Barker. I don't know anybody <laughs> know. Yes. But his great line that I love, there's two lines. One, one, he says, I'm going to live forever. So far, I'm doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> the other line I like, was from John Lee Hooker, who said at 82, it's too late to quit now. <laughs> and that's my philosophy. <laughs> We've just got a couple more questions and then we'll move on. Okay, Sonny. Um, again, uh, with, with such uh, a career here, you have seen a number of, of uh, the guiding lights uh, move on. Uh, to that other plane, wherever that may be, whatever you believe. Wolf, Muddy Waters, Jeff Healy. What, what, do, what do these people leave behind for you? Is there uh, a thread that you can share with us about the great talents and uh, the, the things that still affect you every single day as you move forward? Well, I, I loved Jeff Healy. And if anybody doesn't know his work, you, you should find me. Funny, and when he died, we all knew he was going to pass. And I was the publicist and I had the obit written. And 
His friend called me up from the hospital and says, he's gone, we better. So I just filled in the blanks, you know, when and where and so on. And I sent it out to my list of, I don't know, probably a couple of thousand email addresses. I said, right, now I'm going to the bar and I'm going to get drunk. And then the response came back. I worked till four o'clock that night just with the people who he had touched. And there's so many, you know, we have this time here on earth and the heroes, the ones who've done it right. And either they died tragically or they die of old age or they die of, I don't know. And they pass on and it sobers you because it reminds you yet again that we are mortal and that I, I, I don't like this wisdom of the elders because it's based on the fact, I think, if I may <laughs> say so, that just because you're old, you're wise. And, uh, <laughs> I only chose wise elders, <laughs> I thought. Um, I think the other thing, very briefly, <laughs> I think the other thing briefly that you that has changed in all our lives is the arrival of the, of the computer and the internet and all of that. And it's changed everything incredibly drastically. And it's, it's a constant battle as we grow older to keep caught up with it. I understand Ian now has a cell phone. <laughs> Amazing. I don't. He, he, he doesn't have an email address. I know, <laughs> and he doesn't have a computer, does he? There you go. So um, now he's a year older than me, so it's okay. We're going to finish off now with one more question. We already certainly know that Sylvia Tyson can sing. That was absolutely amazing. Uh, Mr. Mitch Badalik has performed on the stage of the Winnipeg Folk Festival with his banjo, or singing at least. Richard, the, as a publicist, you seem to be the most mythical of artists uh, because nobody's ever quite sure what you do from what I hear from time to time. If there was a song that you were going to sing, what would that song be? And can you give us a verse? <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> Very briefly, when God made me, she said, you will be able, you, you won't be able to sing, you won't be able to dance, you won't be able to play an instrument, but you can talk your face off. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Flohill without his house coat. <laughs> right, before we go to round two, which is going to be the free for all, oh, yes. I must. I was asked by Lewis to give this to Sylvia, and it's the 2013 Spirit of Folk Award, which is being awarded to Sylvia Tyson. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is totally unexpected and, and a great pleasure. <laughs> you earned it. 